So hello from California. Welcome. I'm John, Father John Deere, and this is a special program with the Beatitude Center for the Nonviolent Jesus with my friend, the civil rights leader, Reverend James Lawson. So I'll give an opening prayer. I'll introduce Reverend Lawson, and then I'm going to ask him questions for about 45 minutes, hopefully. And then we're going to open it up for all of you to ask questions. And I'm going to start with you, Raj. I want to introduce a special guest, uh, Jim's and my friend Raj Mohan Gandhi, who's with us today. Today is Gandhi's birthday, and Raj is Gandhi's grandson. And Raj will be giving our next Zoom in November. I think it's November 13th, right, Ruth Ann? Uh, Saturday. And so it might be. This is a test. So, uh, look at my calendar. So, uh, and in a day or two, I'll send you uh, the recording. So a very warm welcome to everybody. Let's begin with a little short prayer. And I just invite us all to relax. Notice how you're feeling this morning and this afternoon. Take a deep breath and really enter into the presence of the God of peace. And let's really welcome the risen nonviolent Jesus here into our hearts and our community. Uh, this morning, today, and, and let's ask for the grace, this great blessing we have to be with Reverend Lawson, that we might become better students and practitioners of nonviolence and better disciples of the nonviolent Jesus. So let us pray. God of peace, thank you for all the many blessings of life, love, and peace that you give us Please bless us today as we listen and learn from our friend and brother, Reverend James Lawson. Bless him and all of us that we might all become better students and practitioners of nonviolence, better disciples of the nonviolent Jesus, that we might all continue to do our part to welcome your reign of peace, love, and nonviolence in our hearts and in the world far and wide. We ask this mighty blessing in the name of the nonviolent Jesus. Amen. So as I said, it's Gandhi's birthday today. We're coming to you on, on October 2nd, and Raj is here with us. And what better way to celebrate Gandhi's birthday than with Tim Lawson and, and Raj Mahan Gandhi. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce all of you, many of you are my friends, to my friend um, and teacher, Reverend James Lawson, whom in 1957, his friend Martin Luther King said was, quote, the leading theorist and strategist of nonviolence in the world. I'm happy to report he was that then and still is that today. I met Jim in jail in Los Angeles in 1990, as you do. We were protesting US military aid to El Salvador after the Jesuits were killed there. We were arrested together weekly for a while. And I saw him many times over the years and we became friends and he was the chair of the board at the Fellowship of Reconciliation and hired me to be the new executive director. And we've spoken together at events over the years. So I'm really glad all of you are gonna to get to be with him. And again, I invite you to think of a question for him. Jim, Reverend Jim Lawson was born in Uniontown, Pennsylvania in 1928. In college, he joined the Fellowship of Re Reconciliation which to Gandhi and Howard Thurman. In 1950, he became a draft resistor and then was arrested for resisting the draft of the Korean War and sentenced to three years in prison and spent 14 months in federal prison, then flew to India where he taught at Hillsip Islam College and met many of Gandhi's colleagues and got to know, including Prime Minister Nehru. He returned to the U.S. in 1956, enrolled at Oberlin School of Theology in Ohio. I think, Jim, that's where you met Dr. King and became friends. And then he joined the staff of FOR, moved to Nashville, enrolled at Vanderbilt, and began holding the famous Nashville trainings on Gandhian nonviolence and direct action. He taught many young people, including John Lewis and Diane Nash, how to organize sit-ins a nonviolent action to confront and end segregation, but that led the national sit-in movement and the desegregation campaign. And John Lewis called his friend Jim. 
the ar architect of the nonviolent movement in America. Jim helped coordinate the Freedom Rides, the Meredith March, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was director of ed nonviolent education at SCLC. He was at the pastor of the Methodist Church in Memphis and invited and helped coordinate the Memphis Garbage Workers Strike and invited Dr. King to Memphis. 1874, moved to LA, where he served for decades as the pastor of Holman Methodist Church and continued to do regular nonviolence workshops and to speak around the country and the world against racism and militarism and poverty. Very involved with unions and janitors. He's taught at Harvard, USC, UCLA, Claremont, and Vanderbilt. He featured in the film Force More Powerful, and he gave the eulogy at John Lewis's uh, funeral. I could go on and on, and there's tons about Jim on the internet, including some terrific interviews. Um, there's one that I recommend in a Christian publication, which I didn't know about, called The Believer, which is a good long interview with Jim. Uh, if you want to follow up with that. But how about giving, since we're all muted, a show of hands to welcome Reverend Jim Lawson to the Attitude Center for the Nonviolent Jesus. So Jim, good morning and welcome. And um, I'm gonna start asking you just a bunch of questions. Now, these are not necessarily the questions you'll see in the other interviews. These are things that I want to ask Jim. And it may not be what you would ask, Jim, so you can get your question. And I want to start on nonviolence, Jim. And just begin by asking your definition of nonviolence, which I just think is so important. You've been teaching, practicing, experimenting with, and organizing nonviolence your whole life. And I wonder how your understanding of nonviolence has changed. So how do you define nonviolence today? Well, uh, John Deere, thank you so much for, for this um, moment. I'm delighted to be here with the Beatitude Center and always pleased to be in your company and the company of people like Raj Mahan Gandhi and others of you who are here. Um, it is hard to define Nonviolence. I, I think it is Gandhi who first used the term nonviolence. And he does maintain in the volumes about him a specific book, Nonviolence and War and Peace. He insists there that the term nonviolence is his translation of the Janus theory and notion of ahimsa. I meant to put that, pull that book from the, my library and put it on the desk here with me, on the table with me, so I could refer specifically to the page, pages. So Gandhi translates ahimsa that had generally been translated as do no harm, do no in injury, Jainism, uh, a religion of India around the time of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, so um, that's one definition that I cling to. It is not specific, but it allows me to function, to live and to practice. But the other thing that Gandhi says in that same volume is that love, and these may not be ex his exact words, that nonviolence is love in action. Uh, nonviolence is compassion and truth in action. And he, of course, put together the word satyagraha to represent tenacia, tenacity in truth, tenacity in the soul, tenacity in God, tenacity in struggle. Uh, 
um, so for me at least, nonviolence is that quality that comes out of, I think, all the great world religions, though I cannot document that by my own study. The notion that the creative force of the universe is love, God is love, at least one scripture reference concludes, and that that love is all encompassing. Gandhi insists, and I think this is Gandhi's great contribution, that therefore the creative force of the universe is the force that we humans must learn to exercise because that force is the only force that can cause the human race to do on earth God's will. And it is power. It is not, I used to be told in college in 47, it's just persuasion. Well, persuasion is a form of power. Uh, I maintain, uh, and I've tried to recover this quote from way, way back, and I ha can't, I have not yet done so. Aristotle says that power is the capacity to achieve purpose. That is power. It is the God-given gift of creation of us human beings. So um, uh, nonviolence has its deep root in the long journey of the human family as so many people operated out of love and truth uh, in spite of what was raging all around them. Then the second thing I want to say is, and these, this is also from Gandhi and King and others, nonviolence is the science of how you create your own life in the image of God. It's the science of how you create a world that practices justice and truth and compassion. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm giving a two point sort of charge, nonviolence and then nonviolence as a science. And of course, Gene Sharp is the first scholar who pulled together a lot of the methodology of science, the 198 tactics or methods that human beings have used across four or five or 6,000 years. So a twofold decision, a twofold definition, a, a definition that the finest thought of the religions of the world uh, reflects on love as truth and power and points to the fact that this is the way the human race, people and the human race discover how to uh, carry out the will of eternity. And then secondly, nonviolence as a science that we're still learning a great deal about as the science of how you bring about personal and social change and establish a world where all of life is honored. Well, Jim, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. I will be thinking about that for the rest of my life. I, I don't think I've heard of nonviolence as a science. I remember when you came to Santa Fe and our friend Ken Bodigan is here for the Campaign Nonviolence National Conference. And in your keynote speech, you, you defined nonviolence as power. I never heard that before. And then um, one of uh, the interviews I read recently you said the first time you spoke in a workshop in South Carolina, like in 1957, Dr. King raised his hand and asked you to talk about nonviolence as power. And you hadn't quite heard that before. So helpful because the culture says we're powerless. 
And Jesus gives us this method of power. So and I'm still talking about nonviolence here. Then when we were at the Gandhi King Conference 20 years ago, and I talked about nonviolence as a way of life, a spiritual path, and a way to change, and I asked your advice afterwards, you said, John, don't forget to use the word methodology when you talk about nonviolence. And you used it just now. I, so I guess I want to hear you say a little bit more of, about nonviolence as a methodology. It's not passivity. And, and, and you, I, you have often said, and I'm, I, I don't do this well enough, that movement people don't use nonviolence as a strategy for purpose. So that's what I'm getting at. Just say a little bit more about nonviolence as a methodology and strategy for social change. Well, uh, I continue to in, in, insist that yes, you, you have to build your life around and live a lifestyle that is a nonviolent lifestyle. And there's a huge range of practices here and in living styles. I like to use the term these days, the religion of Jesus, to indicate that nonviolence is the way one discovers how to live. Mm -hmm. the, the way we have to insist on not are you saved? <laughs> Uh, but rather on in the light of the universe that we've inherited and the gift of our lives, what kind of human beings we ought to be. Mm -hmm. What kind of human beings does the God of the universe, the God beyond the universe require of us? more than any other matter. Now, I happen to think that methodology is an important part of how we live. <laughs> Every single one of us here today will have a, a, a personal daily waking up routine for the day. Uh, and it will differ for many of us in different ways. Uh, I, no, I no longer keep a daily calendar. <laughs> I keep an uh, annual calendar now, much more. And I keep specific days, but my days, I don't have them scheduled from 6 a.m. to midnight or 2 o'clock in the morning anymore. <laughs> um, but I try to maintain a lifestyle that essentially reflects for, for me personally, the religion of Jesus. And I do this very poorly, but methodology and strategy and strategy are critical. Of course, both of them to me means that you have to plan and scheme if you're going to try to exercise the power of truth and love. It won't happen by accident. <laughs> uh, um, and, and I also add to that, there are millions of people around the world who do exercise daily care for life, for their children, for their village, for the street where they live, for the community, for the nation, far more millions of people who faithfully follow a life of love than what we know, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, unfortunately, we have inherited a world that is largely dominated by power brokers of one kind to another. And for me, a part of the nonviolent revolution is to battle and struggle against those power brokers who want the world under their domain rather than under the will of God. And that is a struggle that goes on and on. But I think 
a major contribution of Gandhi again is this, that if we follow the path of love and truth, compassion and care, we will one day shape the earth more into God's will. So Thank you, Jim. Methodology are, are good words. They may mean the same to me as uh, a way of life <laughs> because you have, yeah. to struggle, you have to struggle and scheme your way. I, I hadn't thought of it that way. I see what you're saying. Now. Well, since you, you brought up the religion of Jesus and you were name dropping Jesus, um, uh, you and I, I think I've spent, I, or you certainly have spent your whole life trying to tell the churches and the world that Jesus is nonviolent. And that's what I've been trying to do too. And that's why I started this project, the Beatitude Center for the Nonviolent Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, and that my contention is, as Gandhi said, Jesus was totally nonviolent. If you want to be the a follower of this guy, you, you have to try to be as totally nonviolent as you can. So you, I just wanted to ask you to share more about the nonviolence of Jesus, where you're at with that these days and uh, thoughts about that would help us uh, to understand and embrace and follow his nonviolence more and more. Well, uh, I'm not sure how to answer. That's a, again, a big question. And uh, I have to search around how to be best approach it. Um, if I ever had any doubts about your question, John, they were largely obliterated by the time I was eight years old, uh, in about my eighth year. Because growing up in the streets of Ohio, from the age of four, I did in the streets and parks of Ohio, Massillon, Ohio, experience racist epithets that were directed at me. <laughs> and my custom and habit, in contradiction to my mother's good word, but not in contradiction to my father's word, I would fight with fists and feet and whatever energy was in me. And my brothers and sisters and I, I think, never talked about this. I don't remember talking about it uh, at an early age. But I know that uh, at least Bill and Brother Bill and, De and Sister Daisy also thought when they had these epithets hurled at them. And uh, as I said earlier, I never recall talking about this at the dinner table. Now, we did talk about violence. Uh, my mother was ad uh, adamant that we should not mistreat each other or mistreat other people. And when in the first grade, I had a certain amount of fighting to do because boys wanted to fight me at Lauren Andrews School, never on the school ground, always on the street going home or a street going to school, which was several blocks away. Uh, my mother's word was, you should not retaliate by fighting. Um, but at, at age eight in the fourth grade, in the spring of the fourth grade, I slapped a person on the street, a boy, I think it was a boy probably, I slapped, who yelled at me on Main Street downtown, uh, race, racist epithets. And for the first time, as I returned home from that errand for my mother, I told her about this incident and she responded without turning around to face me from dropping what she was doing. She insisted, Jimmy, what good did that do? And there was a long period of silence in the house as I heard her voice telling me who I was and that I was loved and that I belonged to God, that we were a family of the church. 
and how important that community was to us, that I did not need to use my fist on anyone. And her last sentence to me was, uh, Jimmy, there must be a better way. Um, so from then on, I was confirmed in my uh, already committed life to the community of faith, to the church, St. James Church, where my dad had been the pastor. And um, I um, determined that on the playing field, where it happened more often, I would not get angry anymore because I got a bad hit <laughs> or because some youngster in the game uh, inappropriately hit me in some fashion in football or basketball or other, other, other games that we played. And so for that, from that time on, there has been no compromise in me about the way of Jesus as being the way of truth and love, compassion. And I think there are many, many different stories. But if one goes to the gospel, to the book of Luke, mm -hmm. to the fourth chapter where Jesus returns to Nazareth, there's a story of while men in probably men in the synagogue in the synagogue in Nazareth became very angry at him. And the last verse of that chapter said that as they dragged him out of the synagogue, according to the script, uh, they and they dragged him through the street of Nazareth, which was is, is a very small community still. They took him to the precipice and they were going to throw him over the precipice. And the last sentence in that chapter says, but he made his way through the midst of them and went on his way. Hmm. Now, I maintain that that represents one of the ways in which Jesus walked and lived. He did it with the spirit of compassion and nonviolence. He did not imitate the folk who were angry at him. Wow. And in addition to that, there are stories of many people who've done the same thing. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, wrote a lifelong journal. In that journal, John Wesley acknowledges the times where he was met by a male mob in, on some street or sidewalk or roadway in England as he rode 100,000 miles by horse preaching and teaching. And he tells how he met the mob. Actually, I've read it more than once. Uh, he, he, he actually, because he's met with white male outrage over his teaching and preaching, though he's fairly orthodox Christian, uh, he writes in his journal how he met such a mob. And I don't remember all the points I have it in my library. But first of all, he threw off his hat when he was being dragged and pushed around and hit. He would throw off his hat. The moment the mob came upon him, he started looking to see who were the loud voices in the mob, who were leading the mob. And so after throwing off his hat, he pinpointed the leaders of the mob who were roughing him up and seeking to hurt him. Thirdly, he then fastened his attention on one or two of those leaders. He tried to catch their eye. And then he might ask them a question like, 
uh, sir, have I done you any harm? Do I know you? <laughs> the net result was that John Wesley never got badly beaten and hurt by any of the mobs he met. And in addition to that, on two or three occasions, he writes how in addressing the mob, a leader of the mob would come over to him and look him in the eyes and say, sir, let me stand with you or let me take you to where you're going. Something like that, which basically the, the uh, two or three men in each mob who had their minds intent upon roughing John Wesley out would change their manners and come to his side and walk with him to the house where he was going or to the church where he was going. Now, uh, so Wesley is a, a major witness to that Luke description of how Jesus uh, walked through the midst of an angry group of people who wanted to throw him over a precipice and went on his ministry, went on his way. So uh, I, have, uh, I have every confidence that Christianity is um, um, not <laughs> following Jesus adequately. Christianity has become the great, most powerful religion in the world ever because of its linkage with the Roman Empire in the third or fourth century. And Roman theology that did some Roman Empire theology, it did some changing of Jesus's, uh, of, the, of the books about Jesus, of the theologies about Jesus. I have no doubt. So in my own thinking, uh, Christianity as the most powerful religion in the world must break with the use of that power that has helped to create so much havoc, conquest of nations, telling all kinds of people around the world, your culture, your religion is wrong <laughs> and you must, uh, you must become baptized if you're going to have the right religion. Of course, we have a lot of baptized people in the United States who are <laughs> deeply enmeshed in the cultural forms of sexism and racism and violence and what I call plantation capitalism. So, um, as I read and reread the Bible and especially the books about Jesus, I know full well uh, that in many different ways, Christianity has basic revolutionary change to undergo. And that um, that's been a part of my mission uh, by being uh, in the local church from uh, I've had five, five pulpits across my lifetime, two in Ohio, two in Tennessee, and one in California. From a very early age, I was committed to working at the level of the congregation, which I happen to feel very strongly about and very good about. That's great, Jim. Does that come, come close? I don't know. It does. You're doing fabulous. It was very moving and helpful. And I haven't heard you say some of those things. I'm so glad you told everybody the story about your wonderful mother. I have about three or four more questions I want to ask you, and then we'll open it up. And one, I want to ask one more about Jesus and nonviolence. And you can everything is great. Um, but you know, I named this program, the Beatitude Center for the Nonviolent Jesus. And we have Raj Mohan here. So <clears throat> as I've told you, you know, I, I claim that Gandhi uh, read from Matthew 5 and the Sermon on the Mount 
if not every day, every other day, a little verse in his prayer group. I've studied that. And um, his whole life. So he's reading from the Beatitudes and especially the fifth and sixth antithesis. But here I'm leading up to ask you about the Beatitudes, Jim. Um, you know, and Gandhi was really working on offer no violent resistance to one who does evil and love your enemy. And I found in his letters that Gandhi, you know, he was writing to Christians, he had so many friends, that the beatitude that was most difficult for him was blessed are the pure of heart. And he, I, he, he, throughout his life, he would say, how the heck do I have a pure heart? In other words, a nonviolent heart. I love that, that Gandhi was really wrestling with the Sermon on the Mount. And Raj, you can correct me next time when we're on here. So Jim, I'm just wondering, any thoughts on the Beatitudes? And while you're mulling on it, you may know, you, I guess, I, you know, I wrote a book on them recently. And then I was really, really focusing on the third Beatitude and wrote another book on that. Because basically, when Jesus says, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. Thomas Merton said the word meekness was actually Kingian nonviolence. Merton wrote that brilliantly. But Jim, what still shocks me is that let's say Merton is right. Jesus is going, okay, bless you to the people who are like Gandhi and Dr. King, people of active nonviolence. They will inherit the earth. They will be one with the earth. Well, if you reject nonviolence, you reject the earth, you're not one with the earth, and here we are with catastrophic climate change and so forth. I think they are infinitely interesting. And Gandhi proves that it was by studying them more than anybody else. I just wanted to open it up to you. Do you want to share any thoughts you might have on the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount that you pondered a lot and that stay with you or that you're working on now? Well, it seems to me, it, it seems to me the book of Matthews with the chapters five to seven, the Beatitudes beginning in the first part of chapter five, um, the first 16 maybe verses uh -huh. of chapter 5 it, it seems to me you have to recognize a very important issue that in the last 10 verses of chapter 5 is where Jesus says you have been told you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy but I say unto you love your enemy and it's in that section of 10 verses that Jesus says, um, what do you do when you have an enemy or when you see the enemy? You, you pray for them. If they force you to go one mile, then <laughs> concede and go with them two miles. I happen to think that this actually happened to Jesus. And the archaeologists have discovered an ancient Roman Empire rule that when a Roman official or legionnaire met uh, a person on the roadway and he could say to that person, uh, uh, carry my bag for me, carry my luggage. So Jesus is actually referring to an experience that he probably had more than once. <laughs> right, wow. In an occupied in an occupied Palestine, in occupied Judea and Galilee, where there were Roman soldiers, according to the books on his life, uh, books of his life. So I maintain that those last 10 verses indicate that Jesus with the Beatitudes and those two other chapters, five, six, and seven, is telling us that you have to strategize your way of life if you're going to try to live a life of truth and love. It has to be planned. He gives some suggestions of how you do this. Pray for them. <laughs> Turn the other cheek. Walk another mile. <laughs> uh, he also, in my mind, is saying uh, something like this. Jesus is walking along the road from Nazareth to Capernaum and meets a soldier. As he 
approaches him, he sees that this legionnaire is about his age. As he gets close, that legionnaire said, boy, I need you to take my pack. Uh, and by Roman law, Jesus, irritated as he may have been, takes the pack and returns in the direction he's going. He returns rather from which the direction from which he has come. He is fuming. But as he looks at this, Roman soldier who's about his age, he thinks, he then begins to introduce himself to this Roman soldier. And he asks the man where he's going, where he's coming from, and how long he's been a legionnaire, and is he stationed in Judea or Galilee? And within a quarter of a mile, these two people are in a deep conversation about themselves because the legionnaire is lonely also as it would be for his home and they talk and before they have gone a half a mile Jesus sees this young soldier as he views himself I say that five, six, and seven is the experience of Jesus as a Jewish young person moving around uh, Galilee and meeting the so-called oppressor, oppressor and discovering that the law of Moses is stronger, more powerful for him and molds his life in that fashion. So Matthew 5, 7 to me represents a part of Jesus strategizing how he lives where he has met Roman soldiers who demanded that he carried their pack. Well, Jim, that's wonderful. I hadn't, I hadn't... I'm so glad I'm asking these questions because, frankly, I hardly ever thought about that that way. That the Sermon on the Mount is the teachings from his own experience, because obviously he had to live it to be able to say it. Well, the New Wonderful. Testament, the scholars of the Bible who have studied Jesus maintain that those first chapters in Matthew 5 through 11, maybe, represent the Jewishness of Jesus mm -hmm. and of Judaism, that they are the best records in the um, Bible that we have of Jesus's understanding of being a Jew. Thank you, Jim. I wanna ask you two more questions and I'm gonna open it up. And these are big and ridiculous. So take them wherever you want. Um, I wanted to ask you something about the country and the world today in light of Gandhi and nonviolence and Dr. King. And so the way I, I, I put it is, I, I think I told you this, I found this quote from Gandhi that says, unless a democracy moves towards nonviolence, it has to move toward fascism. Well, we could say we've never even had a democracy, but we're certainly in full on fascism. Maybe you think we always have been. And um, you see it, I mean, white supremacy, Trump, the GOP, racism, permanent warfare, but we're so close to nuclear war, we're destroying the earth. So, uh, so on the one hand, I'm asking you your diagnosis or about the reality we're facing today. On the other hand, I want to ask you about the movement of nonviolence, because Jim and I are students and friends with a great scholar, Dr. Erica Janowitz, 
who wrote the brilliant book, Why Civil Resistance Works and Why Nonviolence Organized as Movements Can Change and Does Change in a Better Way Than Violence. And so, Jim, when I think on all these things, I think as the world, violence gets worse in so many ways, you could say. Maybe I'm hesitating asking you this. <laughs> What we need is a global grassroots movement of nonviolence that connects all the issues, the likes of which the world has never seen. And millions and maybe a billion people are in fact engaged in grassroots nonviolence around the world right now. But that what we're headed is that way. Now, I don't know, I know Daniel Berrigan would say I'm wrong. And I think you could maybe make the case that Jesus would say I'm wrong. It's gotta be organic. <laughs> Okay, so that's my question about the fascism that's happening and uh, a possible upping the ante in the global movement of nonviolence. Uh, one, I rarely use the word fascism to describe the United States. I use the word from the Declaration of Independence, which is tyranny. <laughs> okay, that works for me. <laughs> because it's important to keep our origins in place in our thinking, I feel. It, it, we in the USA. So tyranny is my word. Mm. The present confusing scenery in our society. Though I have to tell you, I don't see myself as being confused. Mm -hmm. I see myself as being challenged and provoked <laughs> to try to do what little I can do <laughs> to establish the rule of God on earth as it is in heaven, which comes from my tradition. Mm -hmm. And so I'm challenged and provoked, and I am saddened by my own inefficiency and incapacities, but I'm much more provoked <laughs> to do all that I can do uh, day by day. Uh, the great cause of the tyr great cause of the tyrannies coming to the foreground. And of the confusion today is the clash between where the nation has been decimating the population of the Indian, who the paleontologists say may have been as many as. 11 to 15 million people in these states of ours, decimating them. The hanging of women, white women, as witches in New England. Pretty severe. The establishment of, uh, and some, some, I'm gonna come back. Some scholars say that Western civilization, European civilization, uh, hung and burned as many as 50,000 women as witches in Europe and the United States. Uh, the establishment of Africa as the dark country continent and using Africans as slaves and the United States having 200, 300 years of slavery and then segregation. And then I maintain the country from that used to be the country of big landowners, big money owners who become the important symbols in the, in the land, what I call plantation capitalism. Mm -hmm. So I, I maintain that's from which we come, but we in the 50s and 60s and 70s began the challenge to change that country that was into a country that we cannot yet see, but which we know 
can come about. So the old is clashing with the movements from the 20, mid 20th century that challenged all those presuppositions that we were an exceptional land. As Reagan said, who could probably civilization that could probably not be destroyed as so many civilizations destroyed previously in human history. So I think the great confusion and the great tensions are between the fact that the Martin Luther King Rosa Parks movement in a radical fashion challenged <laughs> the conventionality of this nation in wrong and tyranny. And that struggle continues to go on. So I, I maintain that Republican Democrat, that's not the issue. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's too bad we don't have a political party that wants to fulfill, we hold these truths to be self-evident, wants to fulfill, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. We do not have a political process except the political process at the grassroots levels because congregations are aroused and reforming themselves. Unions are aroused in some parts of the United States and changing themselves. Almost all of unionism across our country, AFL-CIO, grappling with racism inside the union, male domination inside the union, grappling with racial prejudice and fears, gender discrimination, sexism, the ancient sexism of our world uh, inside the union. Uh, so, so I maintain that the clash between the old that has been severely challenged by a nonviolent movement as never before, extremely revolutionary, and uh, the continuing struggle. This, this is the clash in a nation. Uh, the white men in our country who have lived by the demands of sexism, lived by the conditioning and oracles of racism. <laughs> I would add, lived by, in many cases, a narrow Christianity of domination. Uh, I would say that, that the white men in our country who have lived by violence, hatred, anger, anger over the way in which jobs have been stripped from Janestown uh, uh, of Wisconsin <laughs> to, to uh, uh, Sewickley, Pennsylvania, to the shores of the Atlantic Ocean in Virginia. Um, but on the other hand, knowing that there can be no going back, I think that's the big clash. And, and I have to tell you, John, I am very discouraged when I listen to commentators, read newspapers and magazines, and listen to books and all, um, where people are analyzing our society and talking about where we are and what's going on. And they never meant, mention racism. <laughs> never mention how Christianity is, has told people there's only one savior, one way <laughs> to understand God. Uh, never mention the massive sexism that we have imposed upon women across the face of the earth. So I think the key to the future is the movements in the United States that transform our country from being the symbol of Constantine to becoming clear, massive signs of love and justice and equality and truth. That's good. Let me ask you one last question, then I'll open it up 
Um, but Jim, I still have 500 other questions for you. So we're gonna have to have part two next year because there's too much else I need to talk with you about. Hey, thank you for all of that. There's so much to talk about. But let me add, end with you by asking about Dr. King, your friend and sharing, ask you to share with us any thoughts you have about Martin Luther King for me and the group. And in particular, I remember in Santa Fe saying to you, Jim, you wouldn't believe I just found this quote from Martin Luther King in March 1968, where he announced his definition of hope. And I said to you, Dr. King said, hope is the final refusal to give up. And you looked at me and said, yeah, I was there when he said it. And I don't know if you've noticed and if, you, if you've been back to the National Civil Rights Museum, but there in the bedroom, you know, by the balcony, which is now a glass wall, you can look in and they, no, I take that back. There's, it's a display in Atlanta that I saw. They have Dr. King's suitcase from there. And inside is a manila envelope that he was carrying with him in Memphis on April 3rd and 4th. And he had written in his handwriting, the meaning of hope. And my thought is he was grappling with hope for the first time in his life because things were so hopeless. This is my theory. And I just so want to open that up to you to share, because I never got to talk with you about that quote. I think it's a profound spiritual teaching. Hope is the final refusal to give up. We're going to keep doing this because it's God's will. It's sort of what we began with talking about. And, or any other thoughts you have about Dr. King. And then I will call on Raj Mohan. Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, Martin Luther King, Mark, Martin Luther King Jr. must be given credit for being the man who uh, insisted in Western civilization that the way ahead must become the way of nonviolence. Uh, and that nonviolence non is a power tool. Love is the power of God for life, for giving life and creating life and creating hope. So uh, King, through the Montgomery bus boycott, and then the 13 years of his life in which he um, essentially was assassinated like a crucifixion uh, for his life and work. Um, uh, should be acknowledged as the one who has made the Gandhian message that we go with nonviolence or the human race is going to go towards self-destruction. Um, and I'm grateful that in the 20th century, I met Gandhi <laughs> uh, through his life and work and many, many books. But then also that I came to know of King and we became fast friends and colleagues. And we're, we were planning the future at the time of King's assassination uh, on April the 4th. Uh, so uh, uh, Martin King was another man in the, in the train of a Gandhi. Um, he was the advocate elected so by the people in, in Montgomery. He was an advocate for justice and truth, and he carried out that role in a magnificent fashion. Um, I should say that King was influential in the Montgomery boy bus boycott, the sit-in campaign of 60, the Freedom Ride of 61, the Albany campaign to desegregate of 62, 
The Birmingham campaign is 63 to desegregate downtown Birmingham of 63. The Mississippi summer of 64, which directly produced Head Start for Lyndon Johnson to support. It was created by black women and a white volunteer mm -hmm. in Greenwood, Mississippi. The, the phrase Head Start that today could be the could be um, the the enterprise okay. around which we could change the United States of America. Anyway, the uh, Voting Rights Bill of sixty five. Voting Rights Bill is not as critical as Head Start. I should say that it's not as critical as. Civil Rights Bill of 64 is not as critical as Medicare of 65, is not as critical as the desegregation of immigration that took place in 65 and the immigration bill that the, that the Johnson administration and Congress and the Democratic Party passed. Um, um, voting, um, voting right, the, the ability, capacity to vote is significant, but voting is not as significant as being an engaged citizen, because the citizen who takes, we hold these truths <laughs> to perform a perfect union is going to be a voting person who's gonna vote on the right side of human history and not vote conventionally to maintain the status quo or worse. Um, so uh, voting as an instrument of nonviolence is a part of what it means to be a human being who wants to come, become fully alive, <laughs> wants to be fully transformed into the image of life, wants to be fully a agent of compassion and love. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Thank you so very much for all of this.